how many of you, those of you who know me, um, know I love to garden. It's one of those things that just, it, it's a very calming effect for me. Some people think of gardening as, as just drudgery and work. Plants and me get along fine. They behave themselves. And we get along just great. We, they don't talk back to me. They just grow, and, and that's just all there is to it. And, you know, and, and, you know to me, it, it's, it's just a relaxing hobby type of a deal, because I'll try different things at all, you know, all, all different times a day. But the one thing about gardening that does frustrate me, the weeds. The weeds. How many of you have gardened or have gardened, and you've got that one weed or two that you can never seem to get rid of. It just comes back. When we lived in Stryker in the garden, I had ragweed that always came back year after year. Didn't matter what I tried to do, get it before it went to seed, it would still come back. Every year, always, all the time. This place now that I have, I have this viney thing that grows along the ground and it just spreads out. Yeah, it is. I don't know what it is, but I cannot get rid of the thing, and it is just a pain. So when you're trying to get rid of weeds, what do you do to, uh, to eradicate those weeds? I want to hear what you guys do to these things. Round up. Oh, yeah, the roundup, roundup. But you can't use that in the garden. That's tricky in the garden. It will work, but it is tricky. What else do we use? You pull them. Hole them out. That's a good one. Dig them out. If you can dig them out, if you can find, the, if you can find them, you can dig them out. I have a neighbor guy one day, I, I, I was looking, what in the world is he doing? He had a torch and a propane tank. <laughs> and he was going along his landscape, and he was burning his weeds. I'm thinking, well, you know what? I kind of like that thought. Man, burn the weeds out. There you go. That's one way to have it. You just have a good old barbecue. But the thing is, they still come back. It doesn't matter what it is. You don't plant them there, but they just come back anyways. And as a, as a missionary was, was talking on Sunday night, and he was talking about the, the fact that, that and related us to trees, Christians as to trees, and that we're planted. Well, if we're trees and we're planted, just like a garden, there are weeds that come up. Are there not? those weeds of sin. And they just, they just came to come back and come back and come back. You pull them out, you do this, you do that to try to, to, to take care of the sin that, that happens, that, that, that happens in your life. And it just keeps coming back. And it's like, Lord, I'm tired of this. I'm just tired of the, this sin. You know, but we know according to God's word, as long as we're living on this earth, because of sin, because of the sin nature, we're always going to have a sin problem. It's always going to be there. It's always going to be something there. Paul, what did he say? He says he said he was the chiefest of sinners. He recognized the fact of the fact that of, of his frailty, of the of the sin that goes on in his life. You know, what it is he, you know, you think of Paul. Paul, what did you do to sin? It's like, come on. You, you, when you read what he did, it's like, did you even have time to sin? You know, as busy as he is, you know, you think of him like Ken Dady. Ken, Dady. Ken, how do you have time to do anything like How does someone like that have time to sin? Well, I don't think they do, but you know, we, we know in our human frailty we, we have that and we're subject to that and we're vulnerable to that and it's going to happen. So what do we do with that sin? What do we do to that, with that sin problem to eradicate it? This is kind of a basic thing, but sometimes we need that refresher course. Sometimes we need that just to... Oh, yeah, that's right. I need to be doing this. I need to be doing this. So tonight we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at the kind of reminder of the basics of how to tend our spiritual garden lives and the sin that comes up. And when it comes up, you know, what, you know, what do we do? So how, what are we doing to hack away and kill the sin that just keeps coming up? Now, I can't take credit for the outline of this. Um, John MacArthur, this is one of his, his outlines. So the basic framework is his, his, his outline, and I've just filled in everything else. But his, you know, the main points are his notes. Um, I, I don't know how long ago I got it, but it, I pulled it out. I was like, hey, that, I like this. So 
So what do we do to, to hack away at this sin? How do we, you know, how do we do this? We need to you go to uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Because the first way we do this, Paul, uh, Peter says this, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from, frustly, from, lustly, from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Peter says here, the first thing we need to do, we need to abstain from fleshly lust. In other words, don't plant the sin seed. Don't plant that sin seed. That's a, a stem from it. How many gardeners would, would you plant ragweed in your garden? No, that's the last thing you would want to do, or plant dandelions in your yard or your garden. You know, unless you're one of those people that want the pollinators all over the place, you know, that, you know that's okay. But I don't want them there. You know, you, we're not going to plant weed in our garden like that. So why would we plant sin in our lives? Why would we plant that around us? You know, the, you know he says abstain, so that means it's a choice. It's a choice there to do that. And he says abstain for, for one reason, because it wars against our soul. It says abstain from it because you're war against your against our soul. You know, we can, you know, we can do this in a couple different ways. There's a couple different ways we can abstain from this. He, the first one he gives us right there, he says, what? Flee. He says, he says from abstain from from you know from that. So in so if we go to uh, 1 Corinthians 6:18, let's see if I can collect the right marker here. 1 Corinthians 6:18. Paul says this, flee fornication, every sin that man doth without the body, but he, they, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Paul says this to the Corinthians, he says flee. To flee that, you know, flee whatever that sin that is. Stop entertaining the lustful thoughts. Stop entertaining those things that are, that are there. In Romans 8.13 He says this. Paul is uh, talking to the Romans. He says this: For for if you live after the flesh, you will you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit, you do mortify the deeds in your body, and ye shall live. You know, Paul is saying he says, you know, flee those you know those those lustful thoughts. You know, don't give our attention to it, but but to mortify those things. You know, Paul asks in, in verse 19 and 20, notice what he asks. He kind of asks a couple questions. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to with the glory which shall be revealed. Mm, that is not the right one. That is not the right one. Where was I going with that? You know, but, you know, he, he, he tells us, you know, to flee these to flee these things, to you know, to flee what, what is going on again. The second thing he, he says to do, not you know, not just to you know, when abstaining, you know, you flee, but he says, don't make any provision for it. Don't accommodate it. Romans thirteen, Romans chapter thirteen, verses thirteen and fourteen. Paul's talking here. He says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, nor in drunkenness, nor in chambering, nor in wantonness, nor in strife, nor in envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul talks to them and he tells them, Don't make any provisions. Don't accommodate for it. This provision, this is to, to plan, to act, to supply, to, you know, to, uh, to give some forethought to consider beforehand on how it might happen. Paul says, don't give, don't accommodate, don't make provision, don't give a thought ahead of time that, aha, this is how I might be able to do this. Or if I go here, mm, I'm not planning on it, but it's there, and I know it might be there. Why would I, you know, why would I make provision for sin? To give that spot for it. You know, we, we, you know we, a lot of times we think of, you know, with, with kids and stuff like that, and, and the teenagers, we, we, we tell them we, and we warn them, watch where you're going, watch who you're with, because we understand that that's probably going to be there. But as we grow older, it's still there. 
Those provisions are still there. We may not think of them in that way, but we still have to be conscious of the fact of what might be there, who we're going to be with, where we're going to be. Those, you know, those provisions, you know, don't accommodate them. Don't be there for them. He insists doing, you know, to, but he says instead, look at Proverbs chapter 4. I, I found this interesting. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. Give my markers to work, right? This is the writer, the writer of Proverbs says, starting in verse 20. He says, My son, attend to my words, incline to my, unto my sayings. Let it not depart from thine eyes, keep it in the midst of thy heart, for they are the life unto those that find it, find them, and the health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away there from thee the forward mouth, perverse lips, put away but far from thee, let thine eye look on, look right on, and let thy eye look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left hand. Remove thy foot from evil. The writer says, he says, to attend to godly counsel. Keep your heart right. Put away those things that might be there. It says, ponder the, the path. Amen. Ponder, you know, think, think about that path that we're walking on, where we're going, what we're doing. Don't just, you know, you know those, those people that just kind of willy-nilly just kind of walk around through life, nothing new, just, you know, however life comes, however life comes. They don't think about it. The Bible says we're to, we are to be pondering, to think about it. Think about it. Looking straight ahead. Back in the Olympians, we had this song we say, don't look left, don't look right. Look straight ahead at the guiding light. Those are the words of Olympians. That was a song we sang. But it's true. Don't look left. I will not sing it. Don't look right. Look straight ahead at the guiding light. He says, ponder it. Look ahead. Remove. He says, if you get there, remove your foot from evil. Step away from it. You know, if you're walking on the street, down the sidewalk, and you see a guard, and you see a manhole cover, and it's open, what are you going to do? You're going to walk around it. You're going to walk around it. Or if you're not watching and you fall in it, the next day are you going to go down that same street again? No, you're going to go down a different street. It says, keep your foot from evil. Keep your way from you know, take, Keep away from that. Instead, you know, that's what he's saying. You know, to to do. So the second way. Second way to weed out our lives, weed out our garden, is to fix your heart on Christ. Paul writes in Romans chapter thirteen. I'll get there. Right, so Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 12. We already read most of this, but we're going to read it again because he, you know, because he, he says this, uh, verse, starting in verse 12. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and... Strive for envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, we are to put on Christ. We are to put on, that is. You know, how do, you know, when we put on Christ, that means we need to look at what Christ's example was. What did Christ do? When he was on the earth, how did he live his life? What did he do? How did he show that example? How did he walk that walk? If we're to put on Christ, we need to understand what it is. And we learn this also in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 17. These are very familiar verses. 
I said this is going to be very basic, but this is, these are, again, these are reminders. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in high places, whereof take, take, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day and be able to, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with the truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, put your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take on the shield of faith, wherein you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wickedness, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. He says we are to take on, we are to put this on. These are these things, these weapons, these are these these. These things guard us from sin. They, they, they keep us from it. And they will help us to dig out that sin that's there or help us from planting sin around us and from you know, keeping us from those things. You know, he says, uh, so we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing we do, we are to pursue, we are to pursue being Christ-like. 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, John talks to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the Christians here. Verses 1 through 3, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, we are now the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be like, but we know that when, we shall appear, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We are to pursue being Christ-like. We are called, he says, we are called the sons of God. And because we're the sons of God, um, we have that example of, in a sense, if I can say in a, in a, in a, in a in a very honorable way, we, we can say our older brother, Jesus, in a sense, is our example for us. We're the sons of God, we're adopted, and we're heirs as well. So if we are those things, then we should be able to, you know, we need to be putting on and pursue that being Christ-like in that sense. And with that, then we're also going to be able to do some things. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 13. We're going to go back to this probably a couple different times because this, in these verses just have, have a couple of different applications to them. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. We'll go back to this, and he says this. And remember, he says this, For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die, but if you... But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If we pursue being Christ-like, we will have the ability to mortify, to put to death that sin that's there, to mortify that through the Spirit. You know, if you think about this, this power that we have to be able to mortify sin is the Holy Spirit. And this is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So if that power to be able to raise Jesus from the dead is available to us to be able to mortify ourselves, what confidence does that give us to be able to do this, to know that i got sin. I need to get rid of it. God has given me the power to get rid of it by the Holy Spirit. So I know I have that power. I've seen what the power can do because I read in God's word that it raised Jesus from the dead. So I have this power. So wow, I can have that confidence to know that I can do this. To know that I can mortify the sin. I can get rid of the sin. I can take care of the sin. Because of that, I can have that confidence. When you... when. When your kids are growing up and you asked them a task to do and you knew it was going to be a struggle for them, 
because maybe they weren't quite ready for it, or you knew they were ready for it, but they've never done that task before. But you showed them how to do it. They started to do it. And you saw that confidence in their eyes. Because they knew they could do it. And you could just, and you knew how good they felt after they got it done because they knew that they could do that job. It's that same thing here. When we know we have the confidence to be able to take care of sin through the Holy Spirit to be Christ-like while we're pursuing to put it on the Lord Jesus Christ, how much easier would that be for us to take care of that sin? For us to be able to tell someone else who is struggling in their sin, you know what? This is the truth that's here. Because we are children of God, we have that power to be able to take care of the sin that is in our lives. Sometimes that's all it takes is for someone who has just been tending to be beaten down with a sin. For someone to come along beside them and, and wrap their arms around them and say, you know what? This is what the Bible says. This is the truth that's here. Let's look at it. Now, we see this. Let me help step with you through this, to be able to work through this. And as we see them grow, we can see the confidence that they have in their lives. That's discipleship. That's helping that younger one come along and coming beside them. They're struggling, but we can show them. We're not beating down on them. We're not whipping them constantly, saying how horrible a Christian you are. We're lovingly coming beside them and saying, listen, been there. This is what we can do differently. This is how we can live that life. Psalms gives a warning for those of us that, you know, we don't want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to pursue. We're not fixing our heart upon Christ. Psalms chapter 135. There's this, uh, this warning here. I thought this was a rather interesting warning. And it kind of kind of uh, shows how or why those who don't know Christ act and are the way they are. Psalms 135, verses 15 through 18. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouth. They that make them like unto them, so is everyone that trusts in them. They that make them like unto them, so is every man. The writer is saying here, those who follow, you see, he was, he was making this analogy, those that follow those idols, those that follow sin, become like the sin. You wonder why the world looks like it does? It's because of sin. They're, 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 it, it's, it's, it's pretty simple to see. The world is going to act like it is because it is full of sinners. It is full of those who have not been regenerated, and it's going to continually get worse, and it's going to continually get heaped on this way. So there's no, you know, so we might look back and say, oh, what a terrible world it is. Well, it's, they become like the idol that they serve. But we can become like the idol we serve of sin as well. We can become, we can become that same way. The only difference is we know the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that sin has been taken care of ultimately in our lives, but yet we can still fall into sin, and we can still get into that. We can still step into it. Um, that's why Paul says, don't step there. Get out of it. Remove, remove your foot from it. That's what he says there. So when we are worshiping, we, when we are in the midst of sin, we become like that sin. And it will show. It will show up eventually. It's going to be there. Third way we can uh, take care of this, uh, these, these weeds that come into our lives. You know, we, you know, we take the hoe, we take the roundup, we take the torch to the weeds. Well, we're, gonna take the, we're doing the same thing with our, with our lives, with our sin. What else can we do? 
Well, the next one, ingest the word of God. He says, they went and just the word of God. This is the sword that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the word of God, to ingest this word of God. When we look at Psalms 119, Psalms 119, it is an incredibly long chapter. But as you look at that chapter, as you read through that, that psalm, as you, as you just look at that and just the, the richness that is in there, the whole song that whole song speaks of the Word of God, of knowing the Word of God, of understanding the Word of God, of pursuing the Word of God. In Psalms 119, he, he, it says that, that he might not sin, one, Psalms 119.11, that it might, uh, we might not sin against me. In verses uh, 33 through 40, he, says, he constantly says, it is to keep me. He understood the fact of that. In 105, it says he's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do we understand what that means? It's a lamp and a light. It's two things at once. Wow, isn't that great? We love when we get two things for one, don't we? A two, a two for one deal is great. It's a lamp and a light all at the same time. It's a lamp, but it's a light as well. We can see up here, but we can see down here as well. We can see all over, it cast a big, big beam in a sense to be able to help us to see how to know and how to grow in that sense. In, in Joshua 1, 1, 8, go back to Joshua 1, 8. I love what, what, uh, what the Lord says here to Joshua. Getting ready to go into the promised land. Moses is dead now. All eyes are upon Joshua. He's got, a, he's got a million people somewhere in there that are waiting for him and what needs to be done next. Joshua 1.8. The Lord says this, This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate on it therein day and night, that thou, thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make, their, make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He told them, this book of the law, don't let it depart from your mouth. Meditate day and night, making sure that we have God's word. Make, you know, make, make sure we have this. He says, you know, we are to, you know, this ingesting of God's word, because it is our spiritual food. It, it, it's there. It is our spiritual food. There, and many times in, in the Bible, it's described that way. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, it, it's water. It says, as a tree planted by the water. It is water. In Psalms 119, 103, and in Ezra 3, 3, it's described as honey. Sweeter than honey. Man, I, I, I love Honey, I love, oh, it, it's, just, it's, it's just something. I can take it by the tablespoon, stick it in there, and I eat it. It's like, oh, it just, it, it's good, and it tastes, and it's wonderful. And, and it, it's, it, God's words that same way. Take it by the spoonful and just let it melt in your mouth. Let it melt in your soul. In Jeremiah 15, verses 16 and 17, Jeremiah describes it as food. It, is, it was food to him. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it's milk. All these different descriptions to help us to understand these word pictures that we see, that that is what the word of God is. It's, you know, Paul talks of it as meat as well. So that's, you know, another way, you know, to ingest God's word. Number four. How am I too on time, Nance? All right, good. All right, good enough. I don't have my watch up here tonight. The fourth thing, fourth way to hack away at that sin, prayer. Prayer. Consistent prayer. Pray the Word of God. Pray, you know, pray the Word of God. Take, uh, take Psalms, uh, Psalm 19. Go to Psalm chapter 19. As you read through this, you see David crying out, acknowledging 
a lot of different things. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. The line has gone through all the earth, the words to the end of the world. In them hath he set his tabernacle for the sun, which is the bridegroom coming out of this chamber, rejoices at the strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heavens, and the circuit unto the ends of it. There is nothing hid from the heat of it. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise simple. Are we getting this? The statue of the Lord is right, rejoice in heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, light in the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More desired they are than they are gold. Yea, they are more fine than gold, sweeter than, they, than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is a servant warned in keeping them and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his heirs? Cleanse me from the secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from the presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me, for then I shall be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. How many things in there did he say about? More and over, uh, let's see, the law of the Lord is perfect. Verse 7, the statutes of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are pure, lightning the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Over and over and over again, David writes here the fact that he understood the fact that knowing the word of God, understanding the word of God, was going to keep his way pure. It's going to keep his way right. It's going to help him to endure. It's going to help him keep right. He says it's going to keep him from presumptuous sins. From presumptuous sins. Hmm, that's an interesting, you know, kind of goes along that way that we talked about earlier, those, those sins that we were thinking about. How can I do this sin? This is you know, that the presumptuous sin, making sure he, we don't even get into that mindset of being that way. You know, it, it, it's, you know, David cries all these things out, you know, that it's a matter of prayer and asking and watching and praying lest we fall. You know, these are the, you know, these are the things, you know, that it, it is work, just like weeding the garden work. It's hard. It's frustrating sometimes. You'd, sometimes you don't think that you're going to have a whole lot of uh, success. They just keep coming back, the weeds coming back. But yet we do that the same way with the sin in our lives. It constantly needs to be tended to, looked at, making sure that it's not there, making sure that if it does sprout up, that we're taking care of it right away, making sure that we're looking at it in the right way. You know, you know we all go through times of drought and spiritual drought. You know, we, we find ourselves there. We're in this spiritual funk. You know, sometimes it's like, man, just, just don't seem right. Things just aren't quite clicking in our spiritual lives. And sometimes those doubts come along. Sometimes those things come along. John the Baptist had this. It's interesting. In Matthew chapter 11. You go to Matthew chapter 11. John's in prison at this point. And from what I've heard from described from the prison that he's at with Herod, it's horrible. It's, it's just downright. Prisons today would, are, the, are the Hilton compared to what, what, what John is in. And John, um, Matthew talks, tells about John here. He says now in verse 2, chapter 11 of Matthew. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou that should come, or should we look for another? So John, earthly, he's the cousin of Jesus. A little bit older, his ministry started before Jesus. He's the one who baptized Jesus. He realized, he's the one that says, Behold, the Lamb of God. But yet, here he asks this, he says, Art thou that should come, or do we look for another? He's heard about the works. But yet we, we hear this, this doubt. John's doubting, in a sense. He's discouraged. He's in prison. He knows death is probably going to be coming pretty soon. So he's, he's, he's down. So he tells his disciples, go ask Jesus. 
Find out. I want to know for sure. I want to know. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is, this is John's disciples, go and, show God, go and show John again those things which you do see and hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the leapers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So Jesus sends back word. Word from the word of God. Jesus Christ to John. John, this is what's happening. Take courage. Take notice. I'm telling you, John, and these are directly from Jesus. You can so be almost just like Jesus talking to John. Say, John, this is what's going on. The blind are receiving their sight. The lame walk. The, leper, the lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached to them, John. This is what I'm doing. Stop, in a sense, be encouraged, John. Stop doubting. We can do the same thing. As we read the word of God, it's as if Jesus is talking to us. As we're reading, listen to him here. Just just. Next time you're in the Word, step back a second and ask the Lord to say, Lord, as I'm reading this, help me to hear Jesus read it to me and talk to me. And try to put your mind in that focus that as I'm reading, I'm actually hearing Jesus talk. See what that does as John got to hear Jesus' words. How much this is the same thing. Jesus re giving us his voice in written form to us to be able to keep us from sin, to be able to help us to live that life that we need to live. Those of us who know Jesus Christ our Savior, we understand the importance of that. But maybe there's one here tonight that, that uh, you know, for some reason just hasn't been able to, to pull that trigger to understand the fact that they need to take care of that, that sin problem from the start. That they've never accepted Jesus Christ or Savior, never realized, I have to do the first things first. I have to realize I'm a sinner. I have to accept what Jesus said, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And calling upon him and asking him to be my Savior. If you've never done that, you've all heard my testimony. I was 29, 28 years old when I accepted Christ. Five years of Bible college. Yeah. Three years of Jerry Falwell preaching to me. Yeah. Uh-huh. Thick head. Don't have that thick head. Allow the Lord to speak to you tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the chance to, uh, to just to be refreshed and to understand what, your word of, what the word can do for us, Father how it can help us, how it can guide us, how it can show us to keep our way clear, to keep our minds clear, to keep our hearts clear, to keep that, uh, that, that life that you've asked us to live clean and right before you. We just want to thank you and praise you for the promises, Father, that you've given us. And ask, Father, you would just, uh, you would just guide us through the rest of this evening and through this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.